so welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Lucas Prat, EVP at uh, Power2X, and you just saw the presentation from OCI and, and Linda on low carbon ammonia. You might know Power2X from our uh, green ammonia project in Portugal that was last week announced and awarded with the, uh, the largest subsidy from the European Hydrogen Bank, 245 million. So maybe let me explain you first about Power2X. We're a three-year-old company. We're a project developer, but also a consultant in the yeah, clean and low carbon value chains. So we invest with our own equity to uh, develop, own and operate uh, ammonia, methanol, uh, soft uh, projects uh, with an initial focus on decarbonizing European industry. But we also uh, advise uh, business partners on decarbonizing their operations, so be it refineries, steel companies, and also site uh, and asset owners to convert sites in industrial hubs for the energy uh, transition. And we've got the financial backing from the Canadian Pension Plan, uh, where we're very much aligned on the long-term uh, capital horizon that's needed to accelerate the industry. Uh, but we're also very aligned in terms of our culture of bringing energy, partnership, and integrity to the, uh, to the industry. So maybe a deep dive on our projects that are public, and we have a lot of more projects uh, in our funnel that we have not communicated uh, yet. So Madoka Power2X, uh, together with partners, aims to develop a large-scale green ammonia for export, so 300 kilotons per annum. Erasmo Power2X is a solar to green hydrogen project development in uh, Spain. And uh, in Estonia, we're developing a world-scale uh, biomass to biomethanol uh, project. So we focus on uh, locations that have, competitive, uh, that have intrinsically competitive um, renewable resources and carbon. Um, with the aim to produce at, uh, at world scale. So we have the agility of a developer, but we aim to, uh, to develop projects at, uh, at world scale. And our consulting activities are, are global. So we work with companies uh, across the globe in the US, Europe, um, uh, Africa, Middle East, Asia, uh, to develop energy transition solutions. So why uh, is Powertrex focusing on, uh, on molecules? Basically, a team of founders um, saw the opportunity in the energy transition where a lot of renewables from uh, solar and, renewable and wind came on stream. But there's limited focus a couple of th three years ago on uh, molecules, which we all need to decarbonize the hardest to abate sector. So if you look at our energy consumption globally, 20% is from uh, fossil-based uh, power generation. We see increasing share of, uh, of renewables to make that uh, green. However, 80% of uh, our energy use globally is from uh, crude, uh, coal, natural gas, uh, et cetera. And this is the focus of Power2X to provide sustainable, so clean and low carbon uh, solutions. So we're technology agnostic, so we could develop blue projects as well as, uh, as green uh, projects. So as an example, and this is an example that we did for actually the cluster that we're here, so the port of Rotterdam, um, we looked at how can they create a realistic pathway to decarbonize their carbon-based feedstock. So this is mainly around the, the carbon-based feedstocks that we all need for our materials, and how do we move from a crude oil system that is highly uh, competitive and efficient today, with 95% of, of the products or the feedstocks converted into end products, and how do we move that world into a sustainable future where we're going to tap into different sources of biogenic uh, CO2. And actually, we need all the pathways to fully replace crude. So just to give an idea, in Port of Rotterdam, 200 megatons of crude passes through the port every, day, every year. 150 megatons is transshipped to the hinterland, and 50 megatons is um, converted in port in PETCAM uh, and other systems. And on the right-hand side, you see the solutions that are needed to, to replace that. And if you look at the sustainable, the sustainable carbon feedstocks, you see they're much less efficient. So they take four times as much feedstock for one ton of, uh, of end product. If you look at the scale up and we see at all the solutions that are required, then we see the potential of bio, oil, pyrolysis oil from waste. They all have a role to play, but ultimately a scalable solution is needed. And we believe that methanol could be uh, one of the platform chemicals uh, to serve various end markets. So today you have crude, which has a mix of, uh, of hydrocarbons uh, to be refined to different products. 
and methanol can actually serve as a reverse refineries to build up the products that we uh, need, starting for a more simple molecule to mo building more uh, complex uh, molecules. Also, it's clear that the supply today doesn't exist uh, yet, and a big ramp up is needed to, uh, to achieve in the, in the future. And, and methanol can serve a range of applications from soft uh, maritime fuels, uh, RDME for, uh, for fuels, as well as olefins, acetylene and propylene for, for the chemicals industry. And it's a relatively uh, safe molecule to, to handle. So if we look at the role of, uh, of methanol, we see a big promise by uh, a lot of uh, end markets. Some are really mandate driven around maritime and, and aviation, and others are more driven by voluntary or ETS uh, uh, credits. And while the potential is big in all these applications, there's also a lot of uncertainty that we need to navigate. So in maritime, met methanol could replace uh, yeah, um, uh, different fuels, but also ammonia could compete as a, uh, a shipping uh, fuel. And on the right-hand side, you see the methanol demand sensitivity. If ammonia picks up in shipping, the demand for methanol could be four times as low, whereas if ammonia would not be used uh, as a shipping fuel, the demand for methanol could be four times as large. So there's a big delta in terms of the ramp up of methanol um, that's also impacting the speed of development. The same in aviation fuels. Methanol to SAF could be a very promising pathway. However, today it's not yet ASTM certified. While we believe that it will be uh, at some point be certified uh, as a pathway, the technology is also not uh, yet uh, fully deployed at commercial uh, scale. So replacing all the e-fuels in Europe or supplying that from uh, methanol to jet instead of fissiotrophs could deliver 40 megatons of methanol uh, demand in the future. So these are the, the ranges of demand, uncertainty, and sensitivity that we need to navigate as, uh, as, as developers. And with chemicals, we see some interesting niches where methanol could be used as a sustainable feedstock. Today, it's between 1% and 5% of the, the methanol, of the chemical feedstock that is actually used. It's all voluntary, so the speed of uh, pickup in, in the chemicals industry is going to be longer, and we expect it to be more towards the 2035 uh, range rather than, than sooner. Now, if you look at the methanol value chain, uh, there's a lot of project-on-project -project risk from developing the renewables, getting the access to scarce uh, biomass, to developing the, the, the green hydrogen and the methanol production to then um, supply it into existing uh, end markets. So we help on the production side, uh, the methanol production uh, projects materialize in the most cost advantaged locations, but we also help end consumers, be it chemical companies, airlines, maritime companies, making investments upstream to secure supply to their uh, future uh, feedstocks. And while we do that, there's a lot of uncertainty around what are the technology pathways that will be most competitive. So what's the trade-off between carbon intensity and cost competitiveness? And a lot of these methanol projects are quite distributed and fragmented in locations in Northern Europe, but also in the US, in Brazil, India, China. So how will we get those supplies from those countries in an efficient way to, to Europe, and not burning crude oil in our ships, but also having three, green uh, logistics? So there's a lot of choices to be made around the value chain to connect the production to the, uh, the ultimate uh, end products and, uh, and, and end use. Um, we see the earliest and promising uh, offtake in maritime, uh, where uh, obviously the, the household names and shipping are really leading the pack in terms of developing the biomethanol uh, projects. We also see an increased attention on uh, methanol to, uh, to jet, even though that, that's not very visible in the market uh, uh, yet. Um, and RDME as a drop-in replacement for, for LPG is a, a route that's currently being pursued by a lot of the fuel distributors. However, it's quite uh, challenging to get that cost competitively ag against other uh, alternatives. But there's a lot of decentral and, and fragmented in industry in Europe that need a molecule uh, solution of which RDME could play an important role uh, to serve there. Now, as mentioned, as Power2X, we're active in each of these steps of the, of the value chain. 
uh, from the production of, uh, of methanol to, uh, to end use. And there's a couple of lessons learned on yeah, acting as an investor, as a developer, and also as a consultant in these, uh, uh, in these value chains. So I think the first key takeaway from us as a developer and an investor is you need to have a really an agile mindset because there's a lot of uncertainty in each step of the value chain on sizing the renewables, sourcing the carbon, choosing the technology, the pathway, making the logistics uh, work. Uh, but at the same time, if you don't build it world scale, then you're not going to be cost competitive. So where we thought 100 kiloton methanol plant could be cost competitive, that's today what we really see as the lower end of the uh, production uh, uh, value chain. And we see a lot of companies struggle with going uh, big at the moment, but ultimately that could re result into assets that are just not competitive. Then I think the second part is on the offtakes, there's a lot of interest from airlines, maritime, chemical companies, but they all are faced with developers that have a great idea. They may have a location and a concept, but they have no capital uh, and, and also limited capabilities. So there's a big ask from the off-takers to also invest capital, which they cannot deploy to uh, in, our, in their core operation. So as a project developer, if you can offer a plain vanilla off-take contract without equity, that's really a rare find in the industry, but that could be really truly differentiating for uh, off-takers that don't take the equity risk of uh, investing upstream in these, uh, in these projects. And then the last part is around the financing. Have we seen a lot of IPSI funded projects also struggling to get uh, to retain the subsidies because the development timeline is just too aggressive. We see also competing developers that have the mandate and the obligation to return dividends to their funds in a five to seven year horizon. That's just not going to work in clean uh, molecules. So you need to be more patient, watch the signposts when they're ready, when the regulation is clear, when the infrastructure is there, when the physical assets are being developed to enable these value chains, you need to be really patient to pull the trigger on an FID or advancing a project and not be rushed by uh, the capital discipline of the, uh, uh, of the markets. With that, I leave the floor open to some questions if anybody wants to know more. You can always come to our stand, number eight in hall five. Hello, uh, my name is Tal. I'm the director of sales of Carbon Blue. Uh, I wanted to know which uh, sort of technology do you look at for a feedstock uh, towards uh, creating the e-methanol? Yeah, so we, we as power to wix we look at all the feedstocks. So we look at biomass gasification. Uh, we also look at waste gasification, even though that's not a primary focus of our own uh, feedstock. We also look at biogenic CO2. Uh, from their uh, various sources, for example, captured from uh, biomass firing in power plants, as well as uh, CO2 from uh, ethanol production. Uh, so there's a whole range of, uh, of technologies. As a company, we are technology agnostic. Uh, we look at mature technology that's deployable at commercial uh, scale, um, but we don't have a set concept that we only develop a, a certain type of, of technology. Thank you very much. I wish you a great conference.